Hello, and welcome to the Cruise Consulting Venture Capital Pitch Deck course. We are going to present our top 10 venture capital pitch deck fails. These are the 10 most common mistakes founders make when pitching to VCs. I am joined, as always, by Hayek Camps, who is the well-known venture capital pitch deck consultant based out of Silicon Valley. He's an author for TechCrunch, former venture capitalist, former founder of several startups. Hi, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm super looking forward to this one. It's uh, uh, I always end up talking about all the fun stuff that people get wrong, and it's one of my favorite topics. So let's get into this. It's going to be yeah, fun. Yeah, so it's fun, but I hope that we can help folks avoid mistakes that can legitimately torpo- torpedo your entire meeting. Like I have seen for all of the things that we're listing in here, I have seen fails that basically shut a meeting down or after the founder leaves, the partners all look at each other and say, no, end of story. So let, let's dive in on this. And one of the things that I think we should actually mention before we dive in is that a lot of times VCs are not good at providing feedback about why they're passing on an investment. Yes. In fact, it, it, it never really helps a venture capitalist to be honest with you, which I found out when I was a VC, um, you know, my, my partners always recommended a pretty calm, like, you know, thanks, not right now. And then something pretty generic as a reason why without trying to get in to, without trying to get into sort of the specifics. Um, and I didn't feel that that was right. I was like, I want to give some real pointers here. Um, I'm going to collect the feedback from the partners and share it with the founders. And a few of the times it went really well. And I think the founders really internalized it. But a lot of the times it went very poorly. And um, I think it's hard sometimes to take feedback. And the natural instinct is to want to rebut or argue. Um, and it's, it's usually too late by the time you're getting the no. Uh, and so because of that, VCs are not very good at providing feedback. You're unlikely to actually get the direct feedback from a venture capitalist about what you're doing wrong in your pitch. So we're going to try to help you with these top 10 fails, understand where common mistakes are so you can think about it objectively before you go in and present and avoid these mistakes. All yeah, right? absolutely. I think, it's a, I, th- I think it's a really funny point because if you think about it, um, just to kind of layer something into what you just said, there's no incentive for the VCs to make you a better pitcher. Right. If they decided to pass, you know, why would they care if somebody else invests? You know, the, the VCs only care about the companies that are really in their portfolio most of the time. And so uh, you'll, you'll get a soft no a lot of the time, which is like, come back later, come back this. And occasionally I talk to founders that I work with who said, oh, yeah, I talked to this venture firm that, that I really know really well. And, like, and they said this and this. I was like, OK. I guarantee you that wasn't the reason they turned you down because you are smack bang in the middle of their uh, target zone. L- let's talk about the pitch. Let's figure it out. And it turns out to usually be something related but different. And it goes to your point, right? And it's always something that is like, it is opaque to the founders because they're so deep in it and there's no incentive to actually give any real feedback. Exactly. So hopefully you've been following along. We have a free venture capital pitch deck course available on cruiseconsulting.com slash pitch dash deck. That's K-R-U-Z-E consulting.com slash pitch dash deck. We're releasing a whole series of informational courses and downloadable templates around helping you as a founder prepare your pitch deck. Uh, but you know, if, if you haven't found that, just go find it now. Um, and now let's, let's do it. Let's actually dive into this. Top 10 fails Fail number one, Haya, what do you got? Love it. Well, actually, I wanted to make a quick general point, which is the oh, one thing yeah. that actually isn't like a, a, a pitch deck fail per se, but is the kind of the number one thing that people fall short on, which is uh, being belligerent or arguing. I think if you think about it, what is the VC looking for? They're looking for a return on their investment, but they're also looking for whether you're nice to work with. You know, if they make an investment, they're probably going to be on your board for the foreseeable future. And if you are a horrible person or if you're really difficult or if you don't listen, that is really, really hard. So, you know, they may say something that is wrong, but (laughs) like picking a fight at that point, especially in the early stages, is not the right way to go about it. I think being like firm, but but humble is uh, is a good is a good idea. It's right. So. Oh, the venture capitalists want to be around someone that they like. And the problem is some of the VCs are sort of difficult. Some can be know-it-all. So you might want to argue with them. Uh, it then generally doesn't end well. Uh, you know, it's, it's tempting to have sort of an open mind and say, well, I, you know, I appreciate your point. You know, my experience has been X, but um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to think you know, carefully about what you said. And, um, and I'm going to internalize that. Thank you. Like, that type of thing. It's, it's sometimes hard to do that, particularly when 
you do have a difficult person you're talking with who is maybe saying something that is is possibly wrong, um, but you know that that could also just be a sign that you're not dealing with the right person. Now, well, and this goes two ways, right? The, the venture capitalist wants to work with you on your board and knows that you're work withable, but that goes the other way too. If you think about, hey, am I am I going to be okay talking to, to this person several times a month for the rest of the duration of this company and have them on my board and take their mm-hmm. advice and potentially yep. have them argue against me? If the answer right. is no, don't take their money. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Anyway, should we talk pitch text? <clears throat> Let's do this. Like the uh, third time is the charm. We are legitimately diving in now. <laughs> Major fails. Uh, I'm going to present because I has created some uh, silly examples here of some mistakes, mistakes that we've seen. And this, this is definitely one of the number one mistakes, just completely biffing the team slide. Yeah. And I, there's two ways of doing that, right? For one thing, there's probably way too much information on this slide. Uh, you'd probably don't need a full org chart. You probably don't need you know, typically only the founders and like a little bit about the key members. You don't need your controllers and bookkeepers listed. But more importantly, and this is the really big fail here, which is this is a veggie box delivery startup, right? And I see a CEO, I see a technical team, and I see a financial team. I don't see operations. I don't see supply chain. I don't see like all the things that you really expect from this startup. So if this really is, it looks like an org chart. If this is their full org chart, my immediate question would be, where the hell is your team? How are you going to deliver this product? So yeah, be very careful about what your team actually looks like and make sure you have the right team for the right startup. For sure. And so just in terms of the design of this, an org chart is never going to help you out, at right. least at the early stage. Like It just doesn't help you. In fact, what it probably does is it puts you in the, oh, this guy's probably an executive out of a big company, uh, which is yep. possibly a bad thing to sort of flash when you're trying to go raise money. So I would never present an org chart it is a really bad idea for a venture capital pitch. Well, now, there's other times of, that, that, that it makes sense, right? If you're if you're doing a partnership with a you know massive conglomerate, an org chart helps you understand who the key stakeholders are, so you know who you have to sell and get on board for a project. But that's not what you're doing here, okay? You're a startup, and you're trying to wow the founders with why you are the right team to attack this problem. Yeah. And names don't do that, right? Even if these like Woodrow Writer and Ronnie Reader over here, I don't know why they're good. If you have a world-class CTO, I expect to see some logos here. I expect to see some accomplishments. Did they exit a company? Have they done a startup before? Like, why are they the perfect people to run a veggie box delivery startup? That is the info I want. Names, they're, they're not helpful unless you have like, I don't know, Zuckerberg on there. But in that case, you're probably not watching this video anyway. <laughs> right. Right. So yeah, the purpose of the slide is so that when the VC like has that question in their mind, like, why can't somebody else walk in with this idea and do this? They want to think, oh, wow, you are the team. Like, this is the team that can do it, right? A team might be part of your moat as well. Oh, we have three of the leading uh, artificial intelligence specialists in XYZ, and there's only six of those people in the world. It's like, oh, well, that's a moat. <laughs> you want to die right. like that, right? You know, oh, I was... I founded this because I was a you know X Y a product manager at a large Fortune 500, and I kept having the same problem. So gosh darn it, I'm gonna solve that problem here. Like that is like boom, get that out there. Like make this slide sell. Do not make this slide a list of names. And in fact, even just a list of logos can be bad unless they're perfectly on target or highly correlated with sort of what you're trying to get done here. Yeah. We covered this in great depth in the uh, team slide. So go and watch that one if you're worried about your team slide. Um, but yeah, I, I've seen a lot of people screw this up and, you know, don't be one of them. <laughs> yeah, it can be, it can be pretty bad. Oh my goodness. All right. Well, the next one is the market size. Yes. And let me advance so, to the market. Size. So yeah, go, go ahead. Let's talk about this one. Goodness. So you, we talked about, we have a whole market size uh, and, uh, uh, market opportunity uh, segments, so listen to that separately. But the, the thing people sometimes get wrong is that they try and pitch something in a market that is way too small. And if the market is way too small, then the best case scenario for the VC doesn't show a return. And at that point, there's just not, there, there's nothing, right? So be exactly. very careful with making sure that your um, addressable market and your serviceable markets are big enough that this could potentially be a um, venture scale company. Right, so this this slide is supposed to be silly. Everything about it is supposed to be silly. But basically what we're showing here is that this is a super tiny market. A venture capitalists, there's no way they would ever put millions of dollars into a company if they could, at, if it captured 100% of the market, 
get half a million dollars in revenue. That is a ridiculous trade. Like you would, you would never ever make that, right? So you don't want to show over a ten billion dollar market generally, at yep. eight, or, or sorry, over a billion dollar market at a minimum. But you know, ten billion is is actually pointed in the right direction, right? And the other yep. thing that I think this slide is doing, which besides being silly, is that it's it's basically compounding the total addressable market and the actual service addressable market, right? Yep. So sure, there's a lot of pet owners in San Francisco. Maybe there's like half a million pets, which I actually wouldn't believe that. But you know what, what, if you're doing a thing for dogs, like that's not the right number, right? You have to shrink it down to the dogs. And in fact, the, what the VC is going to be doing in their mind is, well, how many people can afford this, right? So don't confuse total addressable market and the serviceable market um, unless you're doing it on purpose, right? Um, yeah. And I've seen beautiful examples of, of companies doing that on purpose where they're starting with something small and niche. They can get the foothold. They can get the customer base, work on the product, get their sales and marketing down. And then they have a plan to expand into the rest of the market or they have a plan to expand into adjacent markets. That's yep. a slide that I think is incredibly powerful. I think that it's very credible. VCs love this start in one market and move into adjacent market or expand uh, through the market pitch. That is great. That is a great way to do it. This slide is a fail. The market's got to be huge and it's got to be clear that what you're addressing, like that your, what your solution or proposed solutions as you iterate is going to be able to address the number that you're showing up here. Yeah. And I want to make a quick mention here. If you are a uh, sole trader in a half million dollar market that you can actually sell to, you're doing something great. You know, don't, if you're watching this and that is you, but you're not venture investable. And that's the important point here, right? There's a difference between something that is operating at venture scale and something that could be a good lifestyle business. Uh, I applaud lifestyle businesses, but that's not what we're here to talk about. Exactly. Great. Cool. Okay. Next major fail is on the projection slide. Yeah. We see a lot of this kind of thing. And I mean, this is probably the worst slide I've ever designed, but I just wanted to have something here. But the point, the point we're making here is that, look, if you are showing slow, steady growth that just keeps on going forever and goes nowhere, that is not helpful. Yes, you have growth, but this needs to be venture scale. It's kind of the flip side of the previous one. And if your projection is, uh, shows to, that you're unambitious and can't get there, that is awful. The flip side is also true, right? If, if you have a curve that goes just almost straight up, I mean, businesses like that do exist, but uh, they're almost always, um, you know, there's something that happens before that massive up, uh, upswing happens. And it is, we see this on slides all the time and it's just not believable. Like, I don't, I don't believe you when you put this in front of me, unless you have already, unless you're halfway up that curve already and you have a way of growing that further. So my job at Cruise Consulting is to help clients put together their projections or their budgets, particularly as they approach a fundraise. And I see these problems all the time. I see uh, founders who are, oh, I'm trying to be conservative. So they have a very slow growth. Well, guess what? You've just modeled yourself out of a transaction. The growth is not exciting enough to be attractive to a venture capitalist. In fact, if you do think you're gonna have modest growth, you probably are not fishing in the right pond for your fundraise. You don't want to raise venture capital funding because you don't have that you're not going to produce the tremendous growth that the VC is looking for. You should probably be considering another type of financing, like a debt, uh, debt loan, or or something like that. Right? That's not that's the way to go. Um, you know, venture venture capital is not for you. And then, just like you said here on the other side, so ridiculous growth. We have clients who achieve ridiculous growth, and some of them have had a curve like this. Okay, but if you're going to present a curve like this, you better be in it. Okay, like the like this had like from the left here had should be historical. Like you should be somewhere around here, so that the VC can actually extend the line up without having to do this curve. <laughs> okay, yeah. Like if you're if you're in it, okay, present something crazy. All right, that's fine. However, eventually things do want to probably level off like that. That would be more realistic. The other the other correlated to this is a lot of times um, founders show their revenue going up in, in some sort of way like this, maybe not this steep, but pretty aggressively, and they don't increase their expenses at all. Yeah, It's going to be really hard to have a company that has, let's say, a billion dollars in recurring revenue on the same expense base that it had when it was just starting out. You're going to have to add customer service. I'm sure there'll be all sorts of developers, QA, VP, sales and marketing, et cetera, et cetera. So if your company is approaching some ridiculous profitability margin, and by ridiculous, I mean you know, a 50% profitability margin is, is pretty insane. Like 
I want you to take a hard look at it because you, the VCs maybe not won't laugh in your face, but in their in their mind they could be saying, oh, this "Some of them will." Just, <laughs> this person is not a good business person. That that's yep. what their their thought process might be. All right. So, yep. on this slide, you're trying to prove to the VC you're thinking in venture scale, so you want to show something big. But when you hit that crazy hockey stick curve, um, you know you, you probably ought to be in it to present it. Now, the one exception would be uh, at the seed stage, uh, where you, or pre-seed, where you have no revenue. Um, you know, you want to show some sort of, hey, I think I can get to a hundred million dollar revenue in in five years, but you may not necessarily need to present it something like this, right? So, um, just keep in mind your audience. Venture yep. investors theoretically are numbers people. You want to make sure you're talking their numbers, right? Now we are going to provide examples. We have examples uh, of what we think looks good. Uh, you can just get that from our our pitch deck course. Um, just don't don't make this common mistake because it is a really common mistake. Yep. All right. Number four, traction. The traction slide. Right. Oh man, let's <laughs> we can definitely tell some stories about this one. I go ahead and talk about a little bit of what uh, you see that's bad here. So there's two things, right? Traction has to be real and it has to mean something. And it it should point to that you know what you're doing and you're pointing in the right direction. Now, in very early stage companies. Um, you may not have traction, right? There may not be anything happening underneath at all. That is okay, but then don't have a traction slide, right? I see this kind of thing all the time. Press coverage. Well, press coverage needs to translate into something. If it translates into sales, great, but then report the sales, right? Whenever I see press coverage, I'm like, okay, well, you didn't get the sales, so the press coverage was unsuccessful. Like awareness isn't something that's easy to measure. Even companies like uh, you know, Coca-Cola, who do care about awareness, spend so much money tracking it that, you know, as a startup, it's just futile. Same thing with things like uh, product testing. I see this all the time where they're like, we have started making our product and we have lots of internal testing and we'll be, we have 100% automated test coverage. Well, automated test co coverage is something the VP of engineering cares about. Your startup uh, investor wouldn't give two craps. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to them. I have seen this on slides it's irrelevant. I mean, it's important to you as a company, but it doesn't show traction. And the final one is interest. It's like, oh, you know, we are doing a brand new electric car and we have 100,000 people on our newsletter. Great. This is why uh, even, even uh, people like Elon Musk for Tesla, they charge $100 for you to actually put down, to, to reserve your place in the queue. And they know that some people will cancel, but at least you've put some real money down to prove that you're actually interested. Real so, interest is really hard to gauge. That's right. So unless you're doing something like a, a, a content play or a uh, like a social media type of a play, the best type of traction has got to be money coming to you somehow. Yeah. Okay. But it is okay not to have a traction slide. If you don't have a traction slide, you're going to want to use your product slide. Right. So if, you, if traction isn't, if you're not at the point where you've got traction, don't force it. Like you, you, you look like an idiot. So it's just, yep. just there's, I've seen really crazy stuff on here where someone, so, so, someone saying like, oh, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm picking a different celebrity, but it's like Kim Kardashian liked my, like our company's tweet. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, that, that was not traction. That, that might be an interesting story that you somehow weave in here for some reason, but you don't put it on the traction site. You don't claim that that is traction. So yep. traction should be in a, in a, for like the best companies, it is customers giving you some kind of money. Okay. Yep. Or customers, you know, actually in your funnel. Um, and so, you know, adjust this slide or pull it out depending on the stage of your business and do not try to force fit a traction slide into a business that doesn't yet have traction. You're, you're not giving, you're not helping yourself out. Yep. Totally. Okay. Perfect. All right. So, um, now the next, uh, the next big fail that we see pretty regularly is where, uh, companies don't have a coherent story and how you're definitely an expert at helping. Yeah, founders craft their story and, and weave it through their deck. Explain a little bit more about you know the fail you've seen with this. Yeah, I think a lot of the time what happens is that people lose vision of why they're doing what they're doing, which is forgivable because as a startup founder, you are so deep in your in your universe that you kind of forget who you're talking to here, right? You're talking to a venture investor. The product you are selling them is shares in your company. If your pitch isn't that, if your pitch isn't about, hey, this is why this company is going to be valuable, you're kind of telling the wrong story. And it's, it's so easy to do because you spend all day and day out talking to customers, making sales and doing marketing and hiring, recruiting, all that kind of stuff. 
But what you're really selling is the vision of the future and the value of your company. So not having a narrative around there, you know, you're not selling your product to them. And it's so often I sit through an entire pitch and I'm like, I want to buy your product, but I really don't want to invest in your company, <laughs> exactly. which, you know, you might get one customer, but that's not what you're doing here. So exactly. think very carefully about what your end goal is and make sure that the story actually supports that end goal. So an example that, uh, that you, you put together here and actually, you know, it kind of ties into our pitch deck course. So if you haven't seen the uh, welcome slide, um, uh, part or piece of our course. Now you, you, you want to check that out, but the welcome slide is a way for you to kind of start to weave that story in here a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and you know, you've created this silly example where uh, Millicorps is, is like, we're going to blow your mind. It there's no, it doesn't make any sense. Right. Right. It's Un unless you have mind blowing as your specific uh, industry, but even there, you know, I don't know if they're B2B, B2C. I don't know if it's a multi-million dollar company or an idea on the back of a napkin. I don't know how big the team is. I don't know what they're raising. Like this says nothing. You, this is worse than, than, than having no slide at all. So make sure you actually tell, like, tell the story. Like, what are you setting up here? Um, what are you trying to achieve? What are you trying to get across? Your first slide is, as we talk about on, on this part of the course, your first slide is probably going to sit up on the screen for a while while everybody gets their coffees and thinks about their day and introduces themselves to you. Make it count. Make it part of the story. Exactly. Yeah. So that's another important thing to think about with the first slide, setting up the story. There's always this awkward hello, my name is, and the VCs give their background for five minutes when you, when you kick off your pitch. This, this is the slide that's going to be up there. So make sure this slide is starting to tease the story here. Make sure you want, you're wanting the venture capitalists to put down their phones and start to focus. Yeah. And the other way I see uh, an incoherent story is too many examples. Like if you are constantly bouncing back and forth between different examples for for different customer segments, different this, like this often comes up because I work with a lot of B2C customers and they're like, oh yeah, we have a, we have a um, distribution strategy. We have a direct to consumer strategy. We have a B2B strategy. We have this strategy, that strategy. And I'm just like, okay, where's your focus? And this is the thing to remember about a pitch. You don't have to explain the full depth of everything about your company. It is much better to actually take a red thread and pull that all the way through. And then at the end you can say, well, we're doing really well in our B2B, sorry, B2C subscription market. And actually we thought about other market extensions too. And we've done some experiments, yada, yada, yada. That's where you talk about that. Don't try and clump it all together because the story gets so messy and so confusing. And in the end, you know, they sit back and go, okay, what do you actually do? Are you a B2B? Are you a B2C? Are you a subscription company? Do you do distribution? And I've, I've seen, I've sat in meetings where that happens. And at the end they go, oh, no, 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 we're not doing any of that. We're just doing B2C. And the VC just sits there and goes, well, I was kind of benchmarking you against all the SaaS companies I've invested in. And now the whole pitch doesn't make sense. Yeah. So be tight, be focused and keep it together because it is, it is so, you, we get it. I'm excited for you. You are excited about your company, but you have to have a tight narrative to, to really explain what you're doing. That's right. Exactly. All right, so the next major fail, number six, which is which is all too common, unfortunately, is missing important slides. Right. I, I had some fun here making a slide about a slide that doesn't exist. But, yeah. you know, remember to, again, this is about the, the story and about how you do this, right? So yep. uh, what are the slides that are often missing, uh, Hilly? Competition slide, I find, uh, is missing a lot. Yeah. And that is a mistake. Competition is generally good and uh, you want to see competition. You know, ideally you're seeing sort of the old slow moving incumbents as competition in a big market, proving people are willing to spend money and a lot of money for the thing you're trying to solve. Like yeah. don't, don't miss the competition side. Like people, it's, it's, it's a natural question. All VCs are going to have that question. So you want to be able to guide them to who the right competition is. Yeah, uh, we're, we're, you know, very bad things can happen when you don't have a competition slide. Uh, the, yeah. the investors can think there's not a market there, not a solution. The investors can think that you don't, you're not know the market. You're not smart enough to know who the competition is. The investors can imagine that you are like the worst competitor in the market and therefore are going to fail. So set the stage and tell the story about who the right competition is for the thing you're trying to get done. Do not yeah. forget your competition slide. Well, and we covered this in our competition slide quite in depth, but it's worth repeating. You know, when we said earlier, if you don't have traction, don't put a traction slide in, not having competition is not an option, right? That is almost impossible. It is, it doesn't exist. 
because either if nobody's willing to pay for this in some or to pay if nobody's willing to pay to have this problem solved you don't have a business right it's really that simple so it's in some way people are solving this problem currently that is your competition slide whatever the solution is currently put it on there and show right. it and and expect to be to see some pushback and some challenges there that's right and you know we think back to historical examples you know henry ford his competition really wasn't other cars it was horses so you want to talk about the general horse transportation market if you were him right um there's so, so there are people companies whoever your target customer is has to try to be scratching this itch somehow that and, and so you need to be able to talk about that yeah 100 percent all right. Now, the next slide that I see missing a lot or need a lot of help is the um, either the operational plan or the financial side, the projection slide. Uh, yeah, a lot of times I don't I don't see that. And even for a small seed stage company, I strongly recommend some sort of a projection slide or operational projection slide because the investor is going to want to know what they get with the money that they put in. Hey, you're yeah. raising a $2 million seed. What do you look like when you run out of $2 million? How long does that last? These are very common and important questions, right? Yeah. So just make it pretty easy. Like, hey, listen, like, you know, in, in th with, with the $3 million in 18 months, we're going to have these many customers, this much revenue, or we will have developed the product in this way, or we will have reached the following features, or we will have built our sales team out as XYZ. Like, what the heck do you look like while this money gets used up? And are you building something, a company that is worth more money at the end that can raise funding again? Yeah. And it's surprising. Well, maybe not, but a lot of the time um, I, I talk to uh, founders who are like, yeah, I just want to extend my runway, right? They say, We're, we've been working, we've been doing really well. We just need to extend our runway. That is a terrible thing to say. Because really, yeah, great. You can run for longer, but what are you actually going to accomplish? So tie it like... If I'm the investor and I say, I'm going to give you $5 million, what, how is the company different at the end of those $5 million as it is now? Tell that story. And one way of telling that story is through numbers and projections and your operations and that kind of stuff. Show how many people you're hiring. Show what the product milestones are. Show all those pieces. Uh, because if you don't explain that, then you know VCs don't want to just pour money into a hole. And that's really what you're saying if you forget this slide. So it's, it's super, super important. Perfect. Another slide that I think founders are sometimes afraid to put in here if they're first time founders or they're really young is the team slide. Mm -hmm. And you know where you position the team slide in the deck can kind of help uh, mitigate that a little bit, right? If you have a very strong team, you're gonna to wanna to put it right up at the front or sometimes at the end because you wanna end on a high note or you wanna start with a strong note, right? But yep. if you're really young or a first time founder, uh, and you have like, you know, imposter syndrome, essentially like, oh my gosh, why, why do I deserve to run this company or whatever? That's baloney. Like you've got the passion. You, you, you must have some sort of market insight. You still need the team slide. D don't forget about the team slide. Yeah. Yeah. And I think by leaving it out, you're really saying uh, we're not the right team. I don't have faith in my team. Right. And if you don't have faith in your team, what are you doing starting this company? So yeah, be upfront about it. And you know, there's always transferable skills. If you are fresh out of university, explain, or fresh out of college, explain why you are still the right person to do this company. And if you can't explain that and you have any doubts about you being the right person, don't start a company. Go and do something else for a while while you figure, figure out uh, where your expertise is and then start a company. You see so many people come through who think it's going to be super fun to be the next Bezos or the next Zuckerberg. And, you know, I agree. That does sound very fun. But the, the people who reach those echelons are so rare that, you know, explain what your path is going to be to where you're going. And that's what the team slide uh, is for. Definitely. All right. Uh, any other slides that uh, we missed people missing? Those are the main ones. <laughs> that I can think of. Yeah, no, I think those are the main ones. There's a, there's a couple of people who occasionally don't talk too much about product or don't talk too much about the, the, the challenge. And sometimes you can kind of get away with not talking too much about that if you are very early, but you should still have some sort of uh, conversation about what, what you're trying to build and how you're solving a problem. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's very unlikely that you'll forget to add that to your slide deck because, you know, as a founder, you spend a lot of time in that space. It is true, but you do, you do want to make sure you pull your head up. And this goes back a few points to the setting the table and explaining your story, explaining what you do. Um, you know, I, I can't think of specific instances where a partner has turned to me after the founders left and says, I actually don't understand what they do, right? Yeah. That, that is a mistake, right? And it's not that the um, product was too technical. It's that the, the founder really never explained what the heck they do very well. So it's yeah. like... <laughs> make yep. sure you're make sure you're talking about that somehow here. Okay. And, and remember the other piece, having slide decks, like 
it is natural to be nervous, right? You're sitting across from multi-billionaires who are so used to talking to founders who do, do a lot of board work, who know their stuff. If you have a little bit of imposter syndrome, that's an extra good reason to put the slides in. They'll keep you on track. They'll make sure you don't forget anything. They help you remind you of the points you're trying to make and they can be used as a crutch. So make a deck, rehearse with it, and it just makes it really easy to keep you on track. Perfect. Awesome. All right. So next, uh, uh, next major fail we see is, I think, a critical one that even people with a beautiful deck can make, yep. uh, which is not being able to deliver the pitch in different amounts of time. Yeah. Oh, man, this is such a big, I've seen this problem. So, oh my gosh, I can't even, I can't even like to the extent that there's a problem with the coffee pot at a, at a VC firm. Like this can do totally derail the amount of time you have to pitch. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm talking from like actual examples. Like I have been in situations where there's a problem with the coffee pot and the freaking meeting couldn't start. Uh, and so founder only gets 20 minutes. It is crushing. Um, yeah. Or a VC I, turns up late because people, I mean, you, you cannot understand how crazy the calendar of a uh, high, uh, like a, a blue chip VC is. Like if you are a partner at a blue chip VC firm, you are the busiest person in the universe. And it means that your entire calendar is planned to five minutes uh, blocks. It also means that things go horribly awry, right? You're on the board of a company, something explodes, they call you uh, and you, know, you take the call because this is a multi-million dollar investment, you need to have that conversation. So sometimes people turn up 20 minutes late to a 30 minute meeting. And so, and you know, you can say, well, you were 20 minutes late, I'm not talking to you. Well, that says a lot about you as a founder. Or you can say, you know what, I've got 10 minutes, let's do this. Let me talk to you for 10 minutes. Let me explain why what I'm doing is important. And at that point, the only goal of the meeting is to get it rescheduled. Right, if in ten minutes you manage to screw the pooch and nobody's and and they all just go shrug, I don't want to talk to you. In effect, you've kind of torpedoed your thing. So think about it. How would you tell your story in five minutes? How would you tell your story in ten minutes? What is your elevator pitch like? If you stand next to uh, Mark Andreessen in an elevator, literally, and he says, "What do you do?" and you go, "Well, I'm a founder." You get ten seconds to tell the story. In those ten seconds, you either get a business card or you don't. Think about that. How do you condense your entire story down to two sentences or in a meeting that goes really, really well? I've been in those meetings too, right? You sit with an associate and a, and a partner and the partner gets so excited. Somebody else walks by and goes, hey, James, walk in here. I really, you've got to see this, right? It's rare, but it does happen. And you've got to be prepared that people, you know, people will cancel meetings to sit with you for longer. It happens sometimes. You get, you, you don't really have a control over how long you talk. Uh, that is up to the people around you. But what you do have control over is making sure that you nail the story, you tell the important bits first on the assumption that you get cut off later, uh, you don't you don't uh, bury the lead, as they say in journalism. Um, and it's just a really powerful way of making sure that you really get to make your points. And then from there, you flex up and down, right? Your operations plan, uh, if the meeting's running short, you say, look, I've got a really good ops plan, but let's talk about the other stuff first. If you have a lot of time, okay, let's go in deep. Let's, let's dig in. Let's explain when you give me $5 million, how I'm going to spend the $5 million to get to where we need to go. And it gets really interesting. And if you are able to be flexible about that, uh, your meetings will run much, much, much better. I totally agree with you. It is so important to have the ability to hit the important points in your deck in a very short period of time. In yep. fact, I, I recommend having a five, like being able to do it in five minutes and in 10 minutes. I know you've got 15 minutes on here, but there may be a situation where you get a chance to talk to a venture capitalist and you only have five minutes and yep. you can imagine you know, at a cocktail airport, party, at a conference, yep. at a cocktail party. Right. So even then have that tight, tight five minute pitch in your mind, if you're doing it in your mind, although I do recommend having a deck like have, have the outline, like make sure you're not missing anything. Like there are key important points you want to get through. You don't, you don't, you don't want to miss, you don't want to miss it. So again, yep. be ready to deliver this really quickly or uh, over the course of sort of the standard half hour, hour pitch meeting in a partner meeting it could be two hours. However, there's going to be a lot of questions, hopefully if you're doing a good job. So just, just be ready, just be ready. And then the other thing that you have on here that you've, you've touched on a little bit is the appendix slide for deep questions. So these are slides that uh, you don't necessarily want to have in the core deck because it could slow down the conversation or take you down a rabbit hole that you're not interested in going into. But if you do have a partner that is picking on a particular issue, having these in the appendix shows that you're prepared and then gives you the structure to be able to walk through it really cleanly. So yep. great advice there. 
Yeah. And I guess the final point uh, that I'd like to make there is that uh, I, for a while, ran a company called Trigger Trap. And uh, the, what the company did was it created really interesting high-speed triggers for photography. And I actually had, you know, Moo cards, Moo.com. You can make like business cards where every, uh, where every card is a different picture. Well, we got a bunch of our customer pictures and put them on the cards. And so when I was presenting the company, I would get like a, a handful of those cards out and I would actually show the pictures that people had taken with the product. Now, if that is... Uh, in any way relevant to what you're doing, like if you have a visual storytelling part of the thing where the visuals really help, then you can use that as a trick. So what I end up doing is I'd show people the, the pictures and the one they reacted most to, they're like, oh, that's really cool. That's the business card you give them, right? They will never forget you. So do that. It's a, it's a gimmick, it's a trick, but it works. And so if that applies to you in any way, feel free to do that. And it's all about the storytelling and making sure that you can condense the story into a small amount of time. That's a really good, uh, it's an awesome example. That's really cool. All right. So let us move on beyond um, making, being able to make the story adaptable, moving quick. Next biggest fail is definitely missing competitors. Hi, you've, you've created a hilarious slide to do an example of this. Um, yeah. So in this right. particular slide, uh, the company is revolutionizing internet search and say, meet our competitors. Now, honestly, I don't see anything wrong with this slide here, Lee. So we can just move on to the next one, actually. <laughs> These are the only competitors <laughs> I can think of in internet search. Right. They're the only, if you were going to search something, you would definitely ping it. That's yeah, totally. Do. Famously, that's what people say now. Exactly. It's, it's, um, it's just almost, yeah. Uh, so I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen this. It's horrible to miss major competitors. Um, never want to be in a meeting where the VC is suddenly questioning how well you know the market. Uh, and I can, I can actually think of a, I can think of an example. It was a very long time ago. Uh, a founder was trying to, was presenting, uh, this was a, some sort of a pitch competition thing, was presenting an idea where uh, there would be a website that you would go to where you could see the times of TV programming. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds like a really good idea. Let's, let's launch that. And I thought it was a great idea, but he, did never heard a TV guide. He didn't realize that when you have your cable provider, you push a little guide button and it shows the times of the, of the program. It's it, he basically, it seemed like he would never actually used a television before. So, you know, make, don't, don't leave out important competitors. Yeah. And Just we talk about this in some detail on the competitor slide uh, uh, detail as well, where, you know, I was talking to somebody who uh, was, was launching a exercise bike with a screen on it. And I was like, oh, like Peloton? And bless his soul, he'd never heard of the company Peloton. And I was like, okay, well, that's really bad news. Those are extreme examples, and that relatively rarely happens, to be fair. But, you know, know your market. It is so important. And spend an afternoon Googling, right? It'll get you all the information you need. Make a spreadsheet, make a presentation, do whatever you need to do for yourself. Uh, and talk to your customers, your customers, like one of the good questions you can ask them is how do you currently solve this problem? Or who do you think my competitors will be? They will tell you. And at that point you can analyze whether that's correct. And then in that case, what are you going to do to mitigate that as a risk? Or if they're wrong, great, don't worry about it. By the time you're pitching the venture capitalist, you should have talked to potential customers. Yeah. Okay. And one yeah. of the questions should be how are you solving this problem? And they should be giving you names of companies or solutions that they're using. If you want to make sure you know who those companies are, <laughs> just don't <laughs> leave them out. Right. And now if, if your particular product, you know, competes in a, in a, a small segment of the market, or at least initially, and you only want to show those really Uber direct competitors, it's okay to have a slide with that, but then you better have an appendix where you go kind of deeper. If someone questions your knowledge, you want to jump to something where you do have a more robust list. So it doesn't look like you missed everything, right? You it's, it's okay to say, for sure, I know about that. Here's how I've mapped the market. Show a quick slide and say, you know, I, I, these people are not what I would consider a direct competitor because of X. However, I'm, I'm aware that they're in the market, right? So that's an okay way to try to get around it. But, you know, if you're doing internet search, you got to have the Google logo on the slide. Like that. Oh, yeah, that's so the one weird. I left off. Yeah. There you go. Um... There you go. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, now, that next major pitch deck fail is just the amount of, well, text yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 and this is an extreme example but there's a temptation to put too much text on your slides my rule of thumb is like if you are tempted to make the text smaller than uh i think 20 points maybe think about like why like why is there so much text on this slide now there's a difference here which we'll talk about in uh, in a different episode which is about a send home deck versus a presentation deck 
the send home deck, maybe there's space for a little bit more text because you know you want to add context that otherwise you would would have given through a voiceover. But what you don't want is for this slide to show up in a pitch presentation because what will happen, they completely stop listening to you and they diligently start reading because that's what people do or they kind of tune you out or whatever. And for the next few minutes, you may as well sit there singing songs. Nobody's listening to you. They're just analyzing the slide and, and trying to poke holes in it or think of questions or see how this fits into their mental map. Just don't fall for that temptation. It's, it's a waste of everybody's time. Yeah, so what, on a slide, any slide, you have to assume simultaneously that the person, the viewer is only going to read the head, the title, or that the viewer is going to read every single darn piece of text on there. Yep. And it, in the same slide, you could have two partners in a meeting with you, one doing that and then one doing the other thing. So just make sure the slide is going to work in both scenarios. Yeah. And it's a storytelling thing, right? Think about the, the user experience. I mean, that's what you do as a founder. You think about user experience. What is the user experience of somebody looking at this slide? If it's okay. awful, don't do it that way. And I, and I haven't seen this in a long time, but I have occasionally seen folks present where they're literally reading the reading slide. The slide yeah. um, and too much text almost is a temptation to do that. I know it's yeah. a very boring meeting. You're going to lose your audience. Um, that, I don't think that merits kind of to the level of a fail. I haven't seen a founder do that in a long time, but that is, that is a thing that folks do sometimes when they're presenting. I, I see that occasionally when, so the way I work with my um, pitch coach clients is that they often, um, uh, the first session is pitch whatever you have, right? I want to see where they're at, how good their pitching is and all that kind of stuff. And granted, it's pretty under-rehearsed at that point, but they also spend a lot of time um, going over stuff that they are just reading off the slide. And the reason you are there as a, as a founder is to add context and color and magic and passion and all that kind of stuff. Reading off a slide never ends that way. And it's just, it's, it's again, it's a user experience thing. Nobody wants to watch that. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, perfect. And now to our pen, this ultimate, 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 pitch deck fail. Uh, mm -hmm. We definitely see this a lot in a hot market. Uh, it is a, you would be tempted to do this if you're, if you're raising your series A or series B, do not do it. Do not merely reuse the previous deck with minimal text changes. Hopefully your company has advanced in however amount of time between your last fundraise and now you want to tell the story. What the heck happened? Where are you? Why are you bigger, better than you were before? Yeah. Um, you, you, you can't just change the amount of money you're raising and make it go from, you know, pre-seed to seed or seed to series A. Yeah, uh, that, that, is, that is a fail. <laughs> well, and, and, and I think the reason, there's, there's two fails there, right? One is laziness and storytelling. It's, I mean, but the most important thing is you have, as a founder, learned a tremendous amount about your market in the last 18 months. That better be true, because if it isn't, what have you been doing for the last 18 months, right? If you're just heads down building product and you haven't learned anything, you're doing it wrong. It's not a good idea. And so really it's about getting to a place where the, where the story starts to make more sense, your, your understanding of the market and your customers makes more sense, your product sense is, is more strong. And so realistically, that means you start from scratch. The deck, there's nothing left on the deck that is the same. Maybe your vision, but even that probably has been refined. So I would say don't edit, start, start over, start, start from scratch. That's a great idea. And a lot of times you're going to pitch a venture capitalist for a seed and they're going to say, you know, it's super interesting. I'm more of a series A investor. Why don't we connect in 12 months? You know, in 12 or 18 months when you're actually raising that series A, you don't want to present the exact same deck. Now it's good to have something in there so they can kind of jog their memory and, and help them tie. But the real thing you're trying to show them is, hey, I told you I was going to get a hundred customers or I told you I was going to, I had a successful product that was in the insurance market and I was moving into the banking market and I did that and look what happened. Like prove to them you did what you said you were going to do so that they believe that you're a solid operator who can get stuff done. Well, and even if you didn't, that is fine too. It's like, I said I was going to get uh, 30 insurance customers, but it turns out that wasn't really the market that this product was great for. Instead, we got 50 uh, I don't know, banking customers. And actually the revenue was higher and this is all the stuff we learned and this is how the process. You know, being able to roll with the punches, you don't have to keep your promises, but you do have to perform well and, and be able to back up with what you're doing. Um, 
And I think it's it's an opportunity to really have those conversations with your investors as your understanding of the market evolves and, and develops. Yeah, and and keep think think about what the investors want to say. The, the the venture capitalist wants to be able to tell their limited partners, their investors, hey, I made this investment in a really cool Series A company. Mm-hmm. I have known that company for 24 months or 18 months. And over that time, I've I've seen the founder execute and do X or Y or Z, right? So they want to have that long-term relationship with you because one, it helps them get more comfortable. And two, it helps them sell how awesome they are to their investors. So yep. they, they you know, make, make this change, help deepen the relationship, prove that you're doing the stuff you said you were going to do or that you're learning that you can execute. You know, don't, don't just reuse the previous pitch. That doesn't, that doesn't get you there. Yep. Totally. I, uh, I like this. I think we made, uh, made some really good progress uh, on all these uh, slides. And I think the thing I would like to highlight is that it's so much cheaper to learn from somebody else's mistake than to make your own. So, you know, use this, you know, really think about, am I making these mistakes? Uh, and, you know, hopefully some of this was funny and hopefully some of this was helpful, but take it to heart because there's, there's, you wouldn't believe how many of these I see week in, week out. And it's just kind of sad. <laughs> yeah. Well, let, let's, uh, you know, now we've walked through the top 10 pitch deck fails. Uh, why don't we leave with a few just tips, a few helpful things that, yeah, I like that. Should, should be useful to pretty much anybody putting together a venture capital pitch deck. Uh, the very first tip that I have is you got to practice. 100%. You have to practice. Treat this how you treated the presentations you did in high school or college or sales pitches. Just practice this. Really practice it. And yep. practice being able to deliver it in a short five, 10 increment, 10 minutes or 40 minutes or an hour, practice the different lengths, make sure that you can actually walk through it. You've got smooth transitions, the story is tight. And also that you're essentially unflappable. There's going to be questions coming at you. If you're doing a good job, you're going to get questions. You're going to go off track. You know, the practice will help you have that uh, outline in your mind so that you can bring the story back and make sure you hit all your important points. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, there's, there's going to be people around you. If you're a, if you're an entrepreneur, um, ask other entrepreneurs. People have done this before, you know, pitch to your friends, uh, not any friend, pitch to friends who, who understand how this works. If you have any friends who are VCs or angel investors or fellow entrepreneurs, ask for advice, get them to help you, uh, or at least give some feedback on this. What I often do is like my whole kind of coaching, um, uh, program is, is five weeks long. This is pretty intense, but sometimes I just say, look, let me just pitch at me. I'll record it. And I will do a voiceover afterwards for the stuff that worked and didn't work. It takes an hour, but you get so much really good feedback. So find some people you trust and ask them to do that for you. It is, it is really valuable. Yeah. Asking for advice, asking for help, really important. Again, an advantage of being in Silicon Valley is that there are a lot of uh, people around here who have raised. So to the extent that you have friends or connections, who have just raised a similar round or a little bit ahead of you uh, in the fundraising game, ask if you could buy them a coffee and then run them, run, 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 go through your deck and, and get some candid feedback on it. Um, and it's always going to be friendlier and nicer to get it from someone who's not actually trying to give you money, right? They can yep. give you more candid feedback. They're, they don't have any ulterior motives of trying to angle to, to get in there. So get, get help, ask for advice. And again, that is a, that is a major thing that, I do here at Cruise as well. I listen to a lot of pitches uh, because we want our clients to be successful. We want them to raise money so they keep being clients and grow their business and, and you know take care of their uh, the problem that they're trying to solve. So, you know, having the right advisors uh, can can help you out there. And the other folks that are um, great for asking for advice are your existing investors. Yep. Now, you know, you know your existing investors hopefully pretty well, but particularly the ones who are very experienced should be extremely helpful as you get ready for whatever your next round is. Yeah. Love it. Great. All right. Now this is a, this problem I know is a little bit specific to me, but, uh, but a tip is not to talk fast when you don't have a lot of time. That mm-hmm. is definitely something I do, particularly when I'm caffeinated and I feel time crunched. I talk very quickly. I have seen other founders do this. It actually makes it a lot harder for the investor to understand what the heck you're trying to get to say. Mm-hmm. And it just does, it just doesn't come across as credible or professional. So talking fast is not the answer in a time crunch. If you got a time crunch, you want to hit the important points without going into as much detail unless you really need to. Yeah. That's how you get stuff done in a short time frame. Yeah, totally. I um in in a in a dark past, I uh, had a 
I dabbled in stand-up comedy for a bit. <laughs> and it is, a, it is a very specific uh, piece there where you talk about story gates, right? Uh, in a story, it's like you have to set something, you have to give them a piece of information that you then do a callback to later. So from a story point to storytelling point of view you say something early on and you kind of work your way through the story and then you kind of refer back to it that is really what these stories this this pitching is about too you need to be able to kind of make some points along the way and then you pull it together in a in a neat bow at the end or throughout you kind of be able to pick up those things whether that is through examples whether that is through uh, context and all that kind of stuff but you have to make sure that those points land because if you set up a joke early on or you set up a point early on and it and you you try and like tell the punchline later, but you're speaking so fast or somebody coughed or somebody was briefly inattentive, you lose people. So same as with the uh, slide deck, right? Make sure you, you make the points. And after you make a really important point, pause for a beat, see if it sinks in, see if they're like, get it. And I, okay, cool, move on. Because you know, you're going to refer back to it later. This is where the practice and the rehearsal comes in. And in a long uh, pitch, in the, in the hour version of this, you have a little bit more time to space space to play with it but in the short versions you still need to hit those points because otherwise your story doesn't make sense that's right yeah wonderful other other tips well what you said about earlier is like uh like having an ongoing conversation you know if you're raising money right now that can be a little bit tricky but remember that investors typically don't invest in a snapshot they're not just going to look at your deck once and then give you a check it does happen but what happens much more often is that they say, hey, this is interesting. We're interested in this space. You're pretty cool, but maybe a little bit later, right? Keep them in the loop. And now instead of having a single snapshot, they can see you trending. They can see you operating. They know what you're like as a person and as a founder and how you do your, like how you treat people. All of those data points become really important to invest later. In the, in the pitches I've seen and in when I was in venture capital, you often see somebody get a soft no or a check back later and they will come back later. Sometimes third, fourth, fifth time around, that's when the investment happens because the investor wants to see tenacity. They want to see that you're never going to give up no matter what. And as long as you don't get a hard no, keep coming back because if they wanted to have nothing to do with you, they don't want to waste their time. They will tell you no. So, you know, keep going at that. That's right. Exactly. And investors really do want to have that relationship. They want to see the trend. And that is a awesome way to tell the story. Say, hey, six months ago, I told you I was going to do this. And here's what I learned. It, it kind of gets back a little bit to that story gate thing you just mentioned there, you know, bring them along, make them feel like they're part of the journey there. And that, that can actually really help you get them more excited to invest. 100%. All right. So the final tip I want to bring up, and I, I probably two examples I want to talk about with this one is that you want to use your deck as like an outline or a reminder, or even a crutch, mm -hmm. uh, so that you don't forget really important points. Um, specifically, I can remember uh, when I was a VC, I met with a founder several times and brought them in for the final partner meeting. And for whatever reason, the partners were asking a lot of questions and we just didn't do the competition slide. We just you know double clicked over it, didn't do the competition slide. And one of the, after the meeting, one of the, in the partners meeting, one of the partners said, you know what? didn't talk about the competition. I don't think he knows the market. And I was like, wait, no, he told us the market. Like I've talked with him many times about it. Like, you know, he didn't, he didn't talk about it. I, I just don't think he gets it. And the, the, we, we rejected the investment because we didn't talk about the competition side. And that is because the founder got distracted by all the questions coming in and just blew through it. And it was just probably just a double click type error. Um, but you want to make sure you're hitting all the important points because the pitch deck outline that we're recommending um, and that you see you know, pretty much everyone else recommending online, it, yeah. it's the stuff the VCs want to see. Yeah. Um, and remember, and I think there's something interesting there too, right? In, even if you have told the same story to an associate, then associate and a partner, and then associate and a bigger partner meeting, you don't get to skip stuff. You have to bring people along. You can't just trust that the associate and the original partner you spoke with are going to, you know, as you just said, Healy, you stood up for this company and still they got passed by, you know, and it's not that they don't trust your judgment, but it's like, no, this is part of what it's, what it takes to be a founder. You have to be able to tell the whole story every time in order to really land. Yep, exactly. Yep. Um, and the other part of this that um, I have seen one of the best investors that I work directly with who will remain anonymous, but uh, he had a, he had many superpowers, but one of the superpowers 
was uh, he's very friendly and, and um, really engaging. He's actually like some of the best reporters that have interviewed me. Um, kind of just gets the founder talking, mm-hmm. right? Just gets them talking, gets them kind of going all over the place, answering questions in a dialogue. And at the end of the pitch, didn't really go through the slides. It was just a conversation. And what the, what the partner was really doing was trying to see like, how organized is this person? How do they deal with things coming at them from different angles? You know, can they still be coherent, organized, thoughtful, tell a story, get their message across, even when I'm maybe kind of distracting them a little bit. Um, and if you couldn't get through your important points when he was having this conversation with you, in gen- I mean, there were hour long conversations, but again, if you missed important points, that was a negative. Now he didn't necessarily not invest on that, but his strategy was to, you know, his very stated strategy was to just get the person at ease, start throwing a bunch of questions at them. And there's where he thought he would actually see the true metal of that investor. So again, the deck is a crutch. It helps you not forget important points because your deck is organized to tell the story and to sell the business to that VC, right? So you don't want to miss those important points. So just refer back to the deck or the outline, even if you're having that conversation, hopefully you've practiced enough so that you can check off in your mind, wait, did we talk about competition? Oh yeah, we did. Oh, did we talk about the operational plan? Like what we're doing with this money, how much we're raising? Oh yeah, we did. I just make sure that you're getting through all the important points. And again, the the deck is a beautiful outline crutch agenda item for you to do that. Yeah, love it. All right. Well, that is our top 10 venture capital pitch deck fails. Again, a couple we have of bonus a, tips. A free bonus tips at the end. We have a whole <laughs> free course if you like this. We're going through every single slide that you need. Cruiseconsulting.com slash pitch dash deck. We have two free downloadable templates and more. So please go there, find it, follow along. If you need help on just a particular slide, find that particular slide uh, and enjoy the content. We hope it's helpful. Thanks so much for listening. Take care. <laughs>